Dear friends, today is the end of the church year. And just like we did last Sunday, and next Sunday, which begins the church year, we consider the end. Just like in a movie, you see the words, the end, and the titles come up. We're now at the end, considering the second coming of Jesus Christ, which we considered in detail last week. And we will consider that again next week, as a new liturgical year begins with the first Sunday of Advent. But this Sunday we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. And of course our focus then is precisely on the second coming of Jesus, which is a clear revelation in the New Testament. In fact, today we also hear in the second reading a selection from the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible. And precisely the church gives us a little portion of the book of Revelation today precisely because it's the last book of the Bible. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. As I mentioned to you before, when we consider the word kingdom, we can do a word count of the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today, we heard proclaimed by the deacon a portion from the Gospel of John. There are four Gospels, right? Wakey, wakey, we all know that, right? In the four Gospels, if we were to do a word count, put everything through a Word document and through Microsoft, give us a word count, we would find that the word kingdom appears the most. When we hear of the word kingdom, we're thinking of, you know, things like Queen Elizabeth or Prince Harry or uh, the games, uh, the throne of games or games of thrones, whatever it's called. And, but the kingdom is not being referred to in this sense. Kingdom refers to a triple reality in the Gospels. Sanctifying grace, so Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you. Then it refers to the church, and then it refers to heaven. In reality, it's all the same reality. It's the life of grace working within us, the church, and then eternal life in heaven, which is our final destiny. The question then today would be, how then do we become better members of the kingdom? Well, the way to become a good member of the kingdom is precisely to cultivate what begins through our initiation into the kingdom. Our membership into the kingdom of God begins at baptism, where we receive sanctifying grace, divine life within us. So, it's through our spiritual life that we cultivate the life of sanctifying grace within us. Jesus constantly tells his disciples throughout the Gospels, the kingdom of God is within you. So how do we cultivate that life of grace? We've spoken about prayer life a lot because it's something fundamental. And I've offered to you different examples of what that prayer life should look like in your daily life. But let's today, since we already have a selection here from the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible, let's, and this, let's take another portion, another selection from the book of Revelation, which personally, I really like this part of the book of Revelation. I find it to be very inspiring. And it's from Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Maybe you've heard this before. But it's very beautiful to meditate on and to apply it to your practical life. And in this way, this will help us to understand what our spiritual life is, the dynamics of it, what it should look like, and how we are to cultivate it in our spiritual life. Because this is the, this is the magnet. Our prayer life is what brings God into us. So we hear in Revelation 3.20, Look, I am standing at the door knocking. 
If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share his meal side by side with him. Let's listen to this again. Look, I am standing at the door knocking. If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share his meal side by side with him. Here in these words of the, of, uh, the book of Revelation, we find what I would call the dynamics of the spiritual life. First of all, Jesus says, look, I am standing at the door knocking. What does this mean? It means God is always after us. He's the protagonist. He's always approaching us to come to Him. And He does that in many different ways. It could be through the preaching of a homily. It could be listening to the Word of God. It could be through a moment of prayer. It could be through the example and invitation of a friend. How many of us have commented about different friends, priests or lay people who have been in our lives who have invited us into a deeper relationship with God and were mentors for us. Many of us can think of those kinds of people. It could be some spiritual experience in which God not only knocked on our door, He shook the whole house to wake us up. Look, I am standing at the door knocking. God is always after us, inviting us to a deeper relationship. And then what's the next step? If one of you hears me calling. So this is where we need to listen. Discipleship is basically rooted in listening. Listening to the Spirit. Listening to the Holy Spirit calling us. Many times I make this invitation like over and over again. For example, for the sacrament of confession. And I've explained why that is so essentially important not only for our spiritual growth, but for our salvation, our eternal salvation. Do we listen? Do we listen to God calling us to a deeper life in the kingdom? And then it says, if one of you hears me calling and opens the door, so there's an act. This is an act of the will. When we open up our will to God, when we say, come on in and be with me. I want to be with you. I want to join with you in this relationship. And then, so it's an act of freedom. Religion, our spiritual life, our relationship with God is not based on something that we're forced to do. That's why I hate the word obligation. That's why I would never call holy days, holy days of obligation. If you're not here because you want to be here, then go home. Christianity isn't about an obligation. It's a love relationship to be with God, to feast on the Word of God, to feast on the bread of life, to be with God, and to experience the love of God within our lives. God so loved the world, as we hear elsewhere in the Gospel of John, that He came to save us, not to condemn us. If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share his meal side by side with him. Well, what's all this meal thing about? Why are we talking about a meal? Right away, you might be thinking about Holy Communion. But there's something deeper going on here. What happened this past Thursday? For most of you, you, probably all of you, in some moment, at one moment, uh, on Thanksgiving Day, shared a meal with family and friends or just friends. And what happens around the table? Well, there's community, there's family, there's friendship, there's joy, there's memory. There's all sorts of things that happens on the dynamic around the table, but particularly on Thanksgiving Day, which in the American culture has become a very interesting, unique day focused on the family, which is good. And it's, a, it's an expression of the nobility of the people of this country, the goodness, there's goodness there. People travel many, many miles and go through lots of airports sometimes just to be with family on Thanksgiving, and all of that is good. So all of Thanksgiving usually will focus on family and friends, and that's all, and it's all around a meal. Well, here in the book of Revelation, 
our prayer life now is being expressed as a meal. And what does meal mean? It means family. It means community. It means God is calling us to commune in. God is calling us to be partnering with Him as a family. And so therefore, there's a love relationship. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about your prayer life, your spiritual life in that way. So then, if we understand these words of the book of Revelation and what this relationship with God is, then we're going to want to pray. But not just the saying of prayers, but coming to Mass every day, praying the rosary, which is very meditative, or just being with God in quiet, contemplative prayer at home or here in church. Picking up the Bible and just meditating on the Word of God and then just listening. This is what we need to do, and particularly in the frenetic world that we live in today, where there is so much stress and even fears of the future, these moments of peace with God are very important not only for our spiritual life, but for our mental health and physical health as well. Look, I am standing at the door knocking. If one of you hears me calling and opens the door, I will come in to share his meal side by side with him. Revelation 3.20. There you find the guts, the nuts and bolts of what's happening in the dynamics of our relationship with God. Read it. Meditate on it. Reflect on it. It's very beautiful. The next point, then, is to ask ourselves, well, okay, if we're members of this kingdom, then how do we live as members of the kingdom of Jesus? Well, here we refer to the virtue sine qua non. They say in Latin, or the essential virtue of what it means to be a Christian. And that is to live out the virtue of charity with all of its consequences in our daily life. That means patience, kindness, service, forgiveness. These are the elements of charity. We can't be members of the kingdom who are crabby, gossiping, and lack all forms of charity. If we don't have charity, then there's something wrong. And so then we need to work on the virtue of charity and allow it to grow within our lives. And the first starting point in order to develop the virtue of charity is to start from the punto de partida, which is to understand, the starting point, to understand that whatever I do or whatever I don't do, I do to Jesus himself. Jesus associates himself with every human being, whether they're baptized or not, Catholic or not, pagan or Christian, Jesus is there present in every person so that what I do and what I don't do, I do to Jesus himself. And that's what he tells us. And moreover, the, 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 the authenticity of our life is going to be expressed in the living out of the virtue of charity within those moments, each of those little moments, those daily moments in our lives, at home, in the kitchen, in the living room, in the dining room, at work, at school, in the neighborhood, in the parish, so that we have to put, apply practically the words of John the Evangelist in the first letter of John. How can I love the God that I don't see if I do not love the brother and the sister that I do see? And right away you're thinking about the homeless guy that's over on the corner here. Okay, sure, there's a real need there. And that's something that's a very obvious problem that needs to be addressed. What are the solutions for that kind of a problem? Well, people are working on it. But what can I do? Being charitable doesn't mean just giving a dollar to the homeless guy in the corner of wherever. Because that's part of it. But that's not the whole picture. The picture is, what about your son? What about your daughter? What about your mother? What about your father? What about your grandmother that's living all by herself? What about the sick family member that's in the hospital? These are things that you do very well and you understand how to take care of one another. That's what we're talking about. Or what about the people in our neighborhood, up and down the street here, that are in fatherless homes? What about them? That's why, we, that's why I started and put together West Side Helping Hand Precisely, it may not be the solution for everything, but at least it's a start to help children that are at risk and, and, 
and, and, and have serious needs. You just can't sit here and live a comfortable life and do nothing. Or, since we're in our 50th anniversary as a parish, well, how do I express charity towards my parish community? Do I sell the raffle tickets that I've been asked to sell? Do I work the festival that I've been asked to work? Simple things, like making tamales, or chalupas, or selling tickets. Simple things that anybody can do in order that the community can grow and survive. Matthew 25, verses 35 and 36 gives us a program of how to live the virtue of charity. Feed the hungry. We can't feed every hungry person in the world. That's impossible. And once a year, twice a year, we have a missionary that comes through here from Food for the Poor, and he tells us some stories about somebody in Honduras, or in Nicaragua, or in Africa, or whatever. Those are all real needs. But what about the needs right here? The needs right within your own home. The needs right within our own parish. These are real needs. And what I have done personally is say, I can't fix every problem in the world, but I can do what I can do right here in my own little world, which is this neighborhood. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. Visit the sick. Visit those who are in prison. These are, this is how we live as members of the kingdom. Living the virtue of charity. And finally, and something that needs to be addressed on the Feast of Christ the King, are these interesting words that Jesus speaks to Pilate. My kingdom does not belong to this world. My kingdom does not belong to this world. So, in reality, as a Christian people, we have a dual citizenship. You know how some people come into our, into our country? I know friends of mine from Guatemala, they have dual citizenship. They have a passport, two passports. A U.S. passport, because they're U.S. citizens, and they maintain citizenship in the country of their birth, Guatemala. And others do that with Mexico as well, and that's perfectly fine. So we have a dual citizenship. If we were to pull out our spiritual passport, we have citizenship in heaven and citizenship in the United States of America. Usually, in most moments of the history of our own country or other countries, those two citizenships get along just fine. But sometimes they don't. So then what do you do? That's where it becomes very difficult. Just on Friday, we celebrated the feast of Blessed Miguel Pro, who was one of the martyrs of the Cristero Revolution in Mexico. Now, that was a time in history when President Calles in the 1920s, he wanted to obliterate religion, all religion, whatever it was, Catholic, Jewish, Protestant, Indians, whatever. He wanted a complete God, godless, secular state where they wanted to wipe out all forms of religion at all. So the people rose up. And it was very controversial. Some supported the uprising, some didn't, some tried other means. Sometimes there's conflicts. And we see moments of history where we have conflicts in our own country where the two kingdoms clash. One example would be the civil rights movement. And even within the civil rights movement of the late 50s and the 60s and early 70s, there were arguments as to how to do it. People wanted to use more violent means. Martin Luther King insisted on peaceful resistance. There was even disagreement among them, you know, among the leaders of the civil rights movement. Then with the pro-life movement is another example where the two kingdoms clash. And now there's clashes, of course, what's happening with the immigration issue. And what are the answers for that? And so, what do we do? We have to understand that our citizenship with heaven obviously has to outweigh our citizenship here on earth. This is just te temporary. There on earth is heaven. Therefore, we have to form our consciousness properly. And sometimes we may have to stand alone. We have to be careful that as a Catholic people we don't lose our identity. And sometimes you know, it 
could come to the point where you just don't vote for a particular candidate because neither one of them represent what we believe in as a Catholic people. You may have to come to that point. I think we all have at one point. But we can't be voting for people that believe in things that are contrary to Christian principles. Particularly on the, you know, as far as the abortion issue, we have to be very, very careful what we do there as well. At the same time, you can't be voting for policies that rip families apart and send people backpacking to their own countries. That's not right either. We have to look for solutions. Solutions that are just, noble, and peaceful. Very complicated, and it's not easy. But we just can't be just, you know, we have to be informed, we have to read, we have to form our conscience, and if it means that we have to take a stand on certain things, then we do. We just can't go along to get along. My kingdom is not of this world. Normally, the two kingdoms, are, our dual citizenship, they get along just fine. And we're not asking for preferential treatment. We're not asking for a, for a uh, religious state, like a Catholic country. We live in a pluralistic country where there are different religions or no religion at all. All we ask is for our freedom to believe and to act according to our beliefs. That's all we ask for. Don't shove this other stuff down our throats or force us to act contrary to our conscience. So today is the Feast of Christ the King. A very important feast day in which now today we end the liturgical year and next Sunday we begin a new year, interestingly, with the same theme on the first Sunday of Advent. Let us now stand and renew our faith by praying together the profession of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven.